today's webinar on accelerating family planning demand through advanced audience segmentation. I'm Giovanni Cabanis, a program officer with the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs, supporting the Breakthrough Action Project. Today's webinar is being hosted by Breakthrough Action, a five-year cooperative agreement funded by the United States Agency for International Development. The project was developed to lead SBC programming around the world. Breakthrough Action is a partnership led by the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs in collaboration with Save the Children, Think Action, Ideas 42, Canberra Collective, the International Center for Research on Women, and Viamo. Breakthrough Action ignites collective action and encourages people to adopt healthier behaviors by forging, testing, and scaling up new and hybrid approaches to social and behavior change. Regardless of the behavioral outcome of interest or the approach used to address it, social and behavior change interventions are strengthened when audiences are effectively understood, defined, and differentially targeted. Audience analysis and segmentation are critical steps in identifying the wants, needs, and attitudes of a given population and subsequently determining the factors that influence and drive behavior within that population. Therefore, a key challenge and opportunity for SBC program design and implementation is a more nuanced understanding of the audiences we seek to serve and motivate. Recently, programs such as the USAID-funded Transform FAR project have begun to apply advanced methods of audience segmentation adapted for marketing science to increase the impact of their SBC interventions. The results of these methods have generated opportunities to better define, measure, and prioritize audiences. This webinar will focus on those advanced methods of audience segmentation and feature three illustrations of using segmentation to gain a deeper understanding of audiences to design more effective, evidence-based social and behavior change strategies. Our presenters today are Jessica Vandermark and Luis Fernando Martinez. Jessica is a senior marketing advisor for Breakthrough Action, and she'll talk about the use of advanced audience segmentation process that Canberra Collective piloted in Niger and adapted in Cote d'Ivoire. She'll also share her experiences with using advanced audience segmentation to inform the creation of an SBC strategy. Luis Martinez is a social and behavior change communications senior technical advisor with the Transform for Our Project. He'll talk about the process and lessons learned by conducting a segmentation analysis in Cote d'Ivoire. So I'd like to take this moment to introduce our first speaker, Jessica Vandermark, again, the, the Senior Marketing Advisor for Breakthrough Action and a director at Canberra Collective. Her work sits at the intersection of customer insights, social and behavior change, communications, and strategy. She has extensive experience working on family planning, segmentation, social and behavior change, and innovation projects across Africa, Europe, and North America. Jessica has over a decade of experience conducting global qualitative and quantitative market research, and she holds an MBA from the Thunderbird School of Global Management and also graduated with honors from the University of Maryland with the BS in International Management. Jessica, welcome. Thank you, Giovanni. Today, I'd like to present to you with an overview of national demand analysis, um, briefly describe the steps and spend some time talking through the rationale and cases where this approach would be useful, as well as some of the considerations and lessons that Canberra has learned over the last five years implementing this approach with Ministries of Health under the Transform FAR and Azure Payout projects. National demand analysis is composed of six steps. The first step is a landscape analysis, which synthesizes the literature and body of evidence around the social and behavior change context. To date, we have most often applied this to family planning in West Africa, with the, project, with the first project using this approach in Niger in 2013. In conducting this landscape analysis, we learned that this type of approach had not been applied before in the context, further confirming for us the value of using this methodology. And you'll see step two is a supply and demand analysis. We focus mainly on understanding demand, for example, for use of modern contraceptive methods, but we know that it's also important to understand supply factors, such as availability of methods, to fully understand how demand factors may be influenced by the options for access and methods that are available. The demand analysis includes exploratory qualitative research, for example, in depth interviews, focus groups, uh, but also we're trying to integrate more observational approaches, such as photo voice and ethnography, as well as national level quantitative research. It is important to gather robust national level data so that our recommendations can be used by all implementing partners within a given geography, as well as government for national planning and strategy purposes. 
So in step three, we use the quantitative data as an input to segmentation analysis. So segmentation itself is not a new concept, but what we have learned is that often demographic segmentations are applied, for example, youth programming. In a very personal and complex context for behavior change, such as family planning, we believe it's important to look beyond demographic factors and look at needs, attitudes, and behaviors as part of a psychosocial segmentation, which is likely to be much more predictive of future behavior. Next. To give you an example of this, let's look at a segmentation that Camber conducted on a completely different topic, philanthropic effectiveness. We were engaged to understand how foundations and NGOs could encourage Americans to give more and give more effectively to charity. As the percent of household income that Americans donate has remained stagnant since the 1970s. Here we see a subset of the segments that we found. Although their demographic profiles are very similar, their reasons for giving or not giving are very different. We'll see that there's one segment, the cautious driver, who wants to give, but doesn't yet feel they're in a comfortable enough position financially to give more. There's a busy idealist who also wants to give more and often feels guilty for not giving more, but feels more stressed for time and has difficulty making decisions on how and where to give. Another segment is the unengaged critic who could donate more, but actually doesn't see the value in it and is skeptical of how his donated money would be used. So in summary, despite having similar amounts of disposable income, these segments face different barriers to giving more to charity, and the way you would encourage them uh, to, to change their behaviors would be very different. Next. Uh, the next step is recommendation and toolkit development. Here we take all of the insights learned from the secondary and primary research and develop recommendations in collaboration with implementing partners in government. We always provide a profiling tool to help implementers identify segments by asking a short series of questions. And this is because you, with this type of segmentation, you can't look at someone and know their segment as it's based on more nuanced factors outside of demographics. We work with our partners to determine which other tools are most needed, for example, communication materials or a toolkit to help develop adapted programs by segment. Next, in step five, we'll create a forecasting model to determine what impact could be expected if the recommendations are put into place. For example, in the national demand analysis conducted in Cote d'Ivoire, we could see that by meeting just half of the unmet needs for family planning among the three priority segments, Cote d'Ivoire could achieve their FP2020 goals. In the last step, step six, that's action planning. This is very important as sometimes even when there are compelling recommendations and partners willing to implement them, there's a lack of funding or lack of clarity on how to best put those results to good use. We work with our partners to develop this action plan to address those hurdles. So I want to take a minute to step back and say a few things on why we think this approach is especially useful. If you can next, please, advance. And here I wanted to talk about three things. How we try to incorporate best practices from the private sector, when using national demand analysis is most appropriate and useful, and the commonly held assumptions that we are challenging. Next. Of course, the context of the private sector and public health are very different. Notably, the private sector typically has much larger budgets, can more easily conduct research and analyses that are difficult to do in a developing context. For example, conducting rapid online testing and using more advanced techniques such as max data conjoint. These approaches can help distinguish between quote unquote stated and derived responses, but this can be complex if research respondents are not used to participating in research. For example, in Niger, we found that asking women to answer based on a scale of agreement from one to five was just not possible. So we needed to limit response sets to yes or no answers, which also limits the nuance that can be uncovered in the analysis. The private sector is also motivated by generating revenue, highly values disruption and innovation, and is operating in a very competitive environment. These factors lead them to test, evaluate, and rapidly adapt their approaches. When considering behavior change possibilities, let's consider something like the Apple Watch that captures tons of detailed health information at the individual level and can provide instant and adaptive prompts for behavior change. For example, monitoring your sleep patterns and prompting you to go to bed earlier. If we had all of these tools and resources at our disposal, public, self, public sector health behavior change might be much easier to address and measure. It's unlikely that these differences between the private and public sector are going to change overnight. But we have tried to shape a demand analysis approach to learn from and adapt certain elements of a private sector approach, such as some of the more sophisticated research techniques, including audience, advanced audience segmentation and forecast modeling. Next. National demand analysis can be used effectively in a number of cases. To accelerate progress towards reaching national level objectives, such as the FP2020 goals, 
<clears throat> to help predict future trends, to help local actors coordinate around priorities and share a common language around insights and segments, and especially when resources are limited and there is a need to focus on the greatest opportunities for behavior change. Next. So how is this approach different? In our literature reviews and conversations with experts, we heard over and over again this assumption that those with the greatest need or unmet need are the groups in which there is the greatest behavior change potential. In our research in Niger, we saw a clear example of how this is not always the case. The segment with the highest need, which was defined by the percentage of women stating it would be a problem for them if they found that they were pregnant today, was also the segment that would be most resistant to messages or programs around family planning. The segment, which we named the conservative passives, were very concerned about the opinion and permission of others, such as their husbands and other women in the community, were the most likely to believe that family planning is a sin, and despite being very aware of family planning, they were the most passive in their health-seeking behavior. We believe we should move away from focusing on unmet need and think about addressable needs and women's propensity for behavior change. In our discussion, there also seemed to be a belief that behavior change potential was homogenous across and within demographic groups. For example, there is a lot of youth programming, which is a very good thing, but there seems to be an assumption that all youth are the same and have the same needs, attitudes, and behaviors. We've also seen in our research that this is not true. In fact, in Niger, we found that youth fell into multiple segments, and it presents an interesting opportunity to pair a young woman who has a more positive perspective around family planning with her peer who may be more reluctant. Segmentation is an easy way to make this possible. And finally, we have a lot of conversations around prioritization. In public health, there seems to be a strong preference for reaching everyone, often all at once. We believe that in context of limited resources, resources should be first focused on where we think we can have the most impact. For example, if we go back to the example of the conservative passive I spoke about, uh, implementing partners may decide not to focus on that group in the short term. If they're able to reach other segments more easily and slowly shift their opinions and behaviors, then we could perhaps start to see some changes at the social norm level, which may finally help us address the barriers that are the most problematic for a segment mm -hmm. like the conservative passives in nature. Let's look at another example of how segmentation based on these attitudes and behaviors may be more effective. This is a bit of a funny slide, um, but bear with me. If you're trying to program to English men in their mid 60s who are urban and wealthy, all demographic characteristics, then you would reach both of these men. So for those who don't know, the man on the left is Prince Charles, a member of the English royal family, and the man on the right is Ozzy Osbourne, uh, who's a rock star with a fairly wild uh, past. <laughs> they have very different beliefs and attitudes across a number of subjects, and most likely have very different health behaviors. Programming to both of them or communicating to both of them in the exact same way would likely be very ineffective. Next. Now that we've discussed the process and some of the rationale for using national demand analysis, let's dig into the considerations and lessons that we have learned in applying it. Next. First, we'll talk about the considerations. Next. When working with partners who use the national demand analysis results, we've had a lot of discussions and encountered some barriers. First of all, stakeholders working in public health, especially at the Ministry of Health in a country, tend to rely on approaches that have been heavily tested and documented. They have a responsibility, and rightly so, to ensure that they make responsible decisions when it comes to public health initiatives in their country. However, this can also lead to a certain level of status quo bias and reluctance to try something newer. Now, I've already talked around the second point, uh, the prioritization debate that we've encountered. There are, of course, ways to use segmentation to reach all segments, such as using family planning counseling tools that identify the segment of a client and adapt the counseling conversation based on our profile. For example, the starting point messages can be very different. For some women you want to talk about, or you can talk about modern methods very early in the conversation. For others, there's a need to build trust and talk about natural methods or other topics as a starting point. But that is an approach that could be used across all segments. In terms of a toolkit development, there are so many tools that could be developed with national demand analysis insights and segmentation. So it's important to know what would be the most useful. One tool that we'll always provide, as I mentioned before, is this profiling tool to help identify the segments. And that tool looks like a short questionnaire of five or eight questions. Even if recommendations have been validated, there are stakeholders eager to implement, there's a need to think about securing additional resources for using national demand analysis results. So hence, um, consideration around leveraging resources. And finally, there's a real need to refine the way we measure the impact of using national demand analysis. The national demand analysis produces a lot of insights and develops a strategy, but the measurement happens at the level of implementation, 
and then the results had to be analyzed to determine what could be contributed to national demand analysis versus any other factors. We have a few examples of how this can be done and has been done, and it's something I'm very passionate about working on and continuing to improve as part of the national demand analysis approach. Next. The last thing I'd like to talk to you about are the lessons learned from applying national demand analysis. One of the most important is how critical it is to engage with local stakeholders early, often, and on an ongoing basis. Engagement and knowledge transfer from local stakeholders helps to make sure the results are the most robust and useful as possible. And Canberra can also share our knowledge on our methodology so that local partners can lead a national demand analysis by themselves in the future. Of course, as I mentioned, national demand analysis needs to be developed to fit stakeholder needs, both for current and future communication and program. Lastly, we found that by linking our results to and forecasting to national level family planning strategies, it's more likely that local stakeholders will be able to coordinate and use the results. Next. So thank you so much for your participation in this webinar. I hope the presentation was informative and interesting. I'm now going to pass the facilitation back to Giovanni who will introduce Luis's presentation on how national demand analysis was applied in Kosovar. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was excellent. And I think it's very clear from your presentation that it'll be key for us to start moving sort of beyond those just demographic variables and really looking to, into those psychographic factors, the needs, attitudes, and the behaviors of our audiences if we're really going to understand them and create better, more targeted messaging. So thank you again. And now I'll introduce Luis, who will provide us um, with a little bit more information on the segmentation analysis that was conducted in Cote d'Ivoire. And again, Luis is a communication specialist with over 19 years of experience in social and behavior change communication, in training, and human resources development. His current post as a senior uh, social and behavior change technical advisor for the USAID-funded Transform Fire project is based in Abidjan, where he provides technical assistance to local staff implementing short-term innovative SBCC approaches to increase demand for family planning in Benin, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Cote d'Ivoire. He has an MA from the University of New Haven, which he obtained while holding a Fulbright. So thank you again for speaking today, Louise, and I'll hand it over to you. And I think we're just going to take a minute to make sure that we can uh, reconnect Luis's audio before we further advance the slides. The others are male engagement, provider behavior change, and cross sectoral ABC. Um, our frame of reference is the socioeconomic model, but we focus more on the community and interpersonal uh, level rather than the individual. So let's uh, talk about national demand analysis in Cote d'Ivoire. Why using this approach? First of all, we needed a better understanding of the family planning market. Of course, there's information about prevalence, eh, about the met demand, but um, in order to reach the 2020 family planning targets, countries like Cote d'Ivoire need to be more aggressive and be more creative in their approaches and their initiatives. We needed also a better understanding of the target cost because uh, rather than knowing how many women using, are using pills or injections or whether they live in urban or rural areas, we wanted to learn about their attitudes and behaviors towards contraception. We wanted an idea of how it compares the actual number of children that they are adding versus 
the desired number of children and be able to identify those groups of women with higher potential of accepting or continuing to use contraception. Finally, having the ability to forecast and estimate the impact of the recommendation if the efforts are based on evidence and uh, provide a roadmap for government and stakeholders for implementers to target the resources, their the policies, and their strategies. For the national demand analysis, we estimated how different factors like demand, risk, and use interact. And in aggregate, women are having the number of children they want. However, more or less 58% of the women either have an unmet demand, an unaddressed risk, or both. The national demand analysis process in Cote d'Ivoire to three components. First of all, we had a qualitative analysis. It included a literature review, but also interviews and focus group discussions, mostly with women, but also with men, with healthcare providers. And the qualitative analysis itself gave us some interesting insights that I will share in a moment, but also informed a quantitative uh, questionnaire. We had quantitative analysis and audience segmentation following the process. And at the end, the final part of the analysis was sharing the insights, the recommendations with the different stakeholders to validate the results to identify the ideal uh, further uh, steps and, and, and recommendations. So, as I said, the qualitative analysis itself reveals interesting insights. We found overall that we can look at women in three different life stages. Those women that are avoiding pregnancy most likely because they are still too young or not considering marriage. Then we have those women who want to control or master the contraception and, and control their pregnancy. These women we call the family aspiring women. And finally, we have those women who are actually planning their family. They are either limiting or saving the birth, no matter what the reason might be. Later on, with a quantitative analysis, we identified six different segments of women. And we decided to prioritize or focus specifically on three segments. The three family women, those who are still depending on their parents, are not ready to get pregnant. Those uh, that we call strongly aspirational that do want to get pregnant, but not right now. This is not a moment. And finally, the family is limited to those women who may have had the number of children that they already wanted. So, I am not going to go into detail with this slide, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how we analyze different factors to prioritize the segment. We look, for example, at the event demand, whether women consider pregnancy problematic or not, and how we could estimate that they were at risk of not facing the birth. So, as I said, the third stage was sharing the analysis with stakeholders. So, we had preliminary discussions uh, with the donor, with the Ministry of Health, and with selected partners who work in family planning of war. Then we had an early dissemination event with the technical working group for validation of the results and identifying the main recommendations. And then we had the national dissemination workshop with uh, more stakeholders than those specifically working in family planning. Following the national dissemination, we still had individual meetings 
with selected partners like the National Ivorian uh, Association of Family Planning or IMAP, who has an important program, social marketing program of, of family planning uh, products. And then uh, there was a segmentation or a classification to be developed and validated to be used by healthcare providers. And we continue the training of healthcare providers to use the classification. Specifically, we also targeted some other efforts with government. We had discussions beyond the Ministry of Health. Uh, there's some uh, sort of a consortium between different ministries, including Ministry of Youth at Court, Ministry of Education. They are very interested targeting adolescents on family planning. So we have discussions with them on how they could benefit from the national demand analysis conducted. We also lobbied for uh, them to consider uh, guiding the efforts of all the partners regarding communication, whether they are interpersonal, mass media, social media, to customize the messages according to selected or prioritized audience. And finally, lobby for uh, them to consider training trainers to utilize the classification tool. Some of the challenges we faced were logistical, like the local capacity of the consultant, but we also had more pragmatic challenges, like resistance to prioritizing segments and wanting to continue to focus on all the women. Uh, but there was we found some motivation to use the counseling or the segmentation tool as a counseling tool to reach all women. Uh, we also have found some resistance to incorporate the results of the analysis to the national communication strategy. And at present, we have no government healthcare workers using the classification tool, only those in the private sector or working with NGOs. Thank you very much. I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation, Louise. I think it's it's clear from your example that you know one of the key steps is actually using the seg or um, segmenting the audiences using this more rigorous approach, but then moving from there and translating that into something that is practical and usable for both practitioners and also at the strategy level. So thank you for providing that example. And now we're going to hand it back over to Jessica Vandermark again, who will speak on the experience of using the findings from a segmentation to inform an evidence-based SBC strategy. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, today I'm filling in for Abubakar Saudugu, uh, who is the program, uh, the senior program officer within Gender Health, who led the SBC component of the Azure Pay Act project. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Azure Pay Act project. Next. This is a five-year USAID-funded project working in five countries in West Africa uh, that recently ended, so they're still in the process of writing up the evaluation reports. This project had three objectives, um, expanding access to family planning and the range of methods, promoting healthy family planning behaviors, and increasing awareness of the benefits of family planning. And so in Canberra's collaboration with in gender health on this project, we focus mainly on the second objective, promoting uh, healthy behaviors. And we developed a social behavior change communication strategy across four of the countries, Niger, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, and Burkina Faso. Next. The process that we used to develop the strategy, uh, we developed the strategy one per country and then an overarching regional SBCC strategy. Uh, we conducted a situational analysis, uh, looked at insights and barriers, developed a messaging platform for the communications, looked at the customer journey and at what moments it would be uh, more beneficial to pass those messages to the different audience segments, and finally developed a communication framework. And along this process, there were two rounds of primary research. And I think one of the components particularly interesting about this project was we were testing whether or not the Niger segmentation that was uh, developed in 2013-2014 was applicable for these three other countries. So we had one round of testing where we organized focus groups by segment using the segment profiling tool developed in Niger 
and looking at our situational analysis research, tested certain themes and elements that we thought might be different across countries. And then in the second round of research, we were then doing the message testing of actual messages to be used in the campaigns. Next. So one other thing that was very interesting, as I mentioned, to what extent does this Niger segmentation hold in the three other countries? Um, and, and therefore the question of, is there a need to really redo segmentation? How different is it that these countries that are fairly close in geographic proximity? Um, what we learned is that we could find the, the five segments in Togo and in Burkina Faso. The proportions were different. So if you see these first five segments, modern elites, healthy, proactive, traditional autonomous, the conservative passes that I talked about and the sheltered skeptics, the, the top two are really the ones that are more um, proactive and positive regarding family planning, and they have represented a much larger proportion of women of reproductive age in Togo and Burkina Faso. But we, we did find all segments. What we found is that in Cote d'Ivoire, the segmentation didn't apply as well. Um, and that's mainly due to uh, the large proportion of women that actually uh, were before marriage or at the moment of becoming married. Um, there's a larger proportion of premarital sex that's reported in the DHS. And we found that to be the case, is that the five segments in Niger, as in Niger in particular, they tend to marry quite early. Um, the, the concept of family planning and family planning within the concept of a union uh, really occupies all of the women of reproductive age, whereas in Cote d'Ivoire, there seemed to be a large proportion that this just didn't apply to. There's a little bit more on the next slide. Please advance there. Oh, I think we might have taken it out. Um, so the I'll just uh, voice over the, the points I wanted to make there is that the social behavior change context across the five countries was quite different. Um, for example, in Burkina Faso and Togo, what we saw was that uh, despite having a high knowledge of family planning, there was a large gap between, uh, they were still having slightly more children than they said was their ideal. Cote d'Ivoire, the specificity that we found was that uh, there was a larger proportion. The gap between age of first sex and age of first marriage was um, much wider than in the other countries. And then in the short result, the indicators were consistently lower um, than, than the other four countries. So when we looked at the primary and secondary targets, we looked at the segmentations across the four countries. And again, we tried to prioritize which, which segments did we think would have most impact with a social neighbor change communication approach. Um, in Togo, uh, modern elites and healthy proactives, and we also found that in the context of um, a lot of different and various uh, religious leader opinions, they were an important group to consider in terms of the, the campaign. Uh, in Niger, it was healthy proactives and sheltered skeptics, who I haven't talked about much. This is a group who, um, it did tend to be a bit younger, um, certainly had a lack of information and a mistrust uh, around information around family planning. So they really didn't have any good sources or confidence, um, and therefore we're not using, but we believe that was stemming from a place of just lack of information and lack of trusted sources. In Cote d'Ivoire, the segments that we found that didn't exist in the other three countries were this pre-family segment, which was a, a young group who felt that they were too young to, to be married. I think Luis might have touched upon this in his presentation. Family aspirational women who were basically on the point of, of becoming married and, and maybe considering a pregnancy at that point, but could find themselves in a vulnerable situation. And then family planners um, who are in stable relationships thinking about spacing and potentially limiting. Burkina Faso is quite interesting because although the modern elites and healthy proactives were an interesting secondary target, what we found is that the women were especially in contrast to the other three countries, the most resilient to challenges around family planning, around access, and certainly around side effects, um, going back and continuing to try methods until they found one that worked for them. And therefore, we chose as a primary target, the primary audience, the husbands and partners in this case. Next, please. To give you a sense, I won't go through all the detail on this slide, but across the four countries, we really highlighted different themes that were uh, of importance for developing the messaging. And as I mentioned in the steps about we have a messaging framework. So Burkina Faso, I just mentioned this um, kind of interesting concept around the women being particularly resilient. Uh, another factor for Burkina Faso that was interesting is that we saw a strong sense of national unity and pride um, and also the, the name, the word, the term Burkina Faso actually translates roughly to the land of the upright man. 
And so we had a, a concept around what does it mean to be an upright man or a noble woman who is with an upright man and really centered the, the campaign around that concept. In Cote d'Ivoire, so just to show how different these, these overall shared purpose, so sort of the overarching message of the campaign were different. Um, we heard a lot about sophisticated love and a rich life. Uh, they're, they're certainly changing norms, um, particularly in this context of a lot of premarital sex, um, relationships before formal union, um, gender norms and relationship couple dynamics are changing, but that also is leading to a lot of mistrust. Uh, so there was this discussion of uh, actually a desire to have love, have it be sophisticated, have the courage to be honest in your conversations and, and seeing that as really the ideal in couple communication and a rich life, not only materially, but also rich in experiences, which is quite different from Niger. The concept focusing mainly on the health and the benefit of women around thriving families and in Togo around strong relationships and bright futures um, and, and more around a different sort of aspiration for the future. Next, please. So if we look at those key themes, and as I mentioned, I already went through the rationale for target audiences, we developed um, specific activities per country and prioritized activities to fit within the available budget. So in Burkina Faso, there was a grassroots marketing campaign talking about what does it mean to be an upright man before linking it to family planning to raise general awareness and start a public discourse around the concept before releasing a song and radio, radio programming and having them stay at health centers. In Cote d'Ivoire, we had adapted activities per segment. So for the pre-family, uh, we had girls clubs building on their relationships, role play, and sort of building a support structure for these girls as they start to move into some of those critical steps and decisions, decision points in their, um, in their lives. Uh, for the family aspirationals, there was a mobile phone game. Uh, so really focusing on that concept of having honest relationships and making decisions in a couple uh, in, in a very open and transparent way and navigating some of the, the ambiguity that exists around the changing, changing norms in that area. And the family planners, there were sketches in the community and online, um, mainly focused on the specific difficult uh, points in conversations with the segments that we found uh, what are the kind of the, the difficult things to address or to start uh, a conversation on within a couple? Uh, Niger radio spots, there was a, we used an um, interactive voice response line uh, to address uh, some of the questions that we had heard across those segments around family planning and specific methods. And also this concept of a women's testimony, which is meant to be a, almost a word, word of mouth viral campaign. So having women give testimonials around good experiences and particularly women that belong to this healthy proactive segment who's, who's already a bit more positive around family planning, give testimony to how she overcame a challenge regarding family planning and then share that experience with a certain number of her entourage. And also those um, stories were then put on the IVR line. And in Togo, radio programming specifically focused on um, side effects and, and really having a very provocative discussion around some of the topics that we heard uh, in the focus group discussions and specifically with modern needs and healthy practice that were, uh, women were very curious about. Uh, community theater sketches similar to what we had in Cote d'Ivoire with the, with the family planners um, and brochures at Health Center. So the, those activities have all been um, put into place and uh, the Engender Health team is now looking at and like data and we're coming to some initial conclusions around the, the effectiveness and the monitoring and evaluation indicators. Thank you. Thank you again, Jessica. Um, again, it's very helpful to see how a more robust and rigorous segmentation process helps to ensure that both the SBC programs and the subsequent messages that come from those programs are better harmonized and communication gaps are filled because we have a better understanding of those audiences that we're speaking to. So I want to take this opportunity to thank our speakers once again and then also share a few resources that Breakthrough Action has developed to document the approaches used by these projects and also to help other SBC professionals who would like to apply these approaches in their work. We've developed the Breakthrough Action Advanced Audience Segmentation How-To Guide, the Spark page, and a trending topic. The How-To Guide provides 
guidance on how to conduct a safe process of background research, in-depth qualitative research, quantitative research, and advanced statistical analysis to create a representative base of audience segments. That guide is available online as well as as a PDF. Then we have the Adobe Spark page on advancing family planning demand through innovative audience segmentation. The Spark page is a web page that captures the process and outputs of Transform FAR's family planning demand analysis and mail segmentation analysis in Niger. The Anima Situr projects experience piloting segment-based counseling tools in Niger and the work, again, of Azure PF to incorporate the results of the national demand analysis in Cote d'Ivoire into an SDC strategy. And finally, the trending topic brings together these resources um, on a single web page providing tools, program examples, and some peer-reviewed literature on the utilization and evidence behind uh, audience segmentation and advanced audience segmentation. So thank you everyone for listening to this webinar. Thank you for those who presented. And if you're interested, please continue the conversation on advanced audience segmentation on our Springboard for Health Communications site. There is a discussion thread there um, where our speakers have already addressed some of the questions, but please feel free to continue to add to that thread. Thank you again and have a great day, everyone.